a Thikas N5200 Pro that I got a little bit ago, quite cheaply used. It's a little home NAS, it has a Pentium 3 in it, has five drive bays, dual gigabit ethernet, and I've done a little bit of modding to it, but I've never used it too much, so I kind of want to do that now. First mod I did is you can cut out where this hole is and just port a VGA port in it. And I did that, which just gives me VGA out, because with the default NAS, they assume you don't want that. And once you do that, you can get a normal BIOS in, you realize it's just a standard x86 system running a Pentium 3. It's a bit slow, but you don't need that much for a NAS normally if you just want to copy files over the network. And I'm going to try to turn it into like a little backup spot, back up all my stuff too as kind of a, this is my vault where I can store stuff and just leave it off. So I copy files to it for a day or two and then leave it off and kind of say file stay here. Let's go take a little peek inside it and see what it has. So there's three little thumb screws at the back, which this is actually surprisingly easy to work on for a pre-made NAS, it seems like. And this comes off, you unplug the fan connector, and then the whole front kind of just lifts off. And then we can see a few things here. So this is the motherboard for the system, which has that Pentium 3 I talked about a little bit ago. Now this heatsink, it's actually a mobile one, it's actually even socketed, you could change it if you want. A single memory stick with 512 megs on it. You get this little guy, which I took off a little bit ago, which is a 128 meg IDE flash drive. You can get bigger ones, but we'll talk more about booting in a little bit. I'm just going to not use it for now. And I feel like it's not worth my money to try to go on eBay and get like a 2 gig or something at this point in time. Just boot from the USB. Um, looking at the board, the board can kind of slide out. And there's not really much of a reason to do it. It's not much to see, but let's do that anyways. Once you unplug the front connectors here, you can get these two little guys off. The front connector has a little screen here and a few buttons. I think it needs some proprietary driver. They don't really want to reverse engineer that driver out of here, so I'm just going to admit that they don't work. On the back of the board, you find a PCI Express looking slot, but that's not PCI Express. More on that in a little bit. The single memory slot, the rest of the board we saw, a gigabit ethernet with a surprisingly large card. It's interesting how they did that. And a lot of chips. And you kind of realized old motherboards needed lots of chips because today, the, all of these big chips here are pretty much built into the CPU. And with modern motherboards, especially with kind of more embedded processors like you find in a NAS these days, you don't need any additional chips really. We find hiding at the bottom here is a little power supply. It looks like it's a 200 water from its rating. And also from the um, power connector that it's using, it looks like a standard-ish ATX one. So it's pretty normal. Um, it's, I think that's Flex ATX they call the form factor, but I don't use that too often. So this looks like a PCI Express slot. I'm assuming it would fit into a PCI Express, as in it's pretty much the same exact form factor as a standard PCI Express card. But it's not. As you can see, there's no devices here that would use PCI Express, and there's also power going over it. So do not plug this into a normal motherboard, or plug a normal motherboard into it. It will cook stuff. You can also see these pins are all shorted. It looks like they're all ground pins, except for these which are power, and a couple of them on this side which are actually SATA. So these are just five SATA connectors. And then we find the power supply hiding in here, when it looks like it only has the 4-pin and the 24-pin, unless they cut off or are hiding the other ones. Actually, let's pop out the power supply, see what the power supply looks like. Here comes out the little power supply, which looks like a Flex ATX one. Uh, you can see it's just a big nest of cables at the other side. There's also quite a bit of dust under it. Looking at the power rail readings, we have 14 amps on the 12 volt, uh, which are up to 168 watts on the 12 volt rail. Nothing too exciting. It looks like they probably had spots for other ones. I should probably wipe this dust off. It's definitely been used. Most NASs probably get quite a bit of dust because they get used a lot. And it has a little fan in it. I don't really feel like cracking it open. To my knowledge, it works fine, and that's all I really care about. The next question is, what do you run on this thing that I was going to do? So, I've actually played with running this Debian on this guy in the past, and it's actually ran fine. Um, for running the OS, I can't seem to get it to boot off an internal drive, and it's also kind of a waste to me of an internal drive bay just to run the um, OS off of. So, I almost always just run the OS on a um, USB stick and it can boot from USB just fine. A few other limitations is it's a 32-bit only system, so that gets rid of most other ones. I could probably technically run some versions of Windows. It might take a bit of hacking though, because they don't want to run as USB. Also because it's a Pentium 
3. It doesn't want to run things like Windows 10 very well. It might run 7, though. And those don't like to boot from USB as well as um, Windows 10 does. So that's pretty much we're going to just say Windows is a non-option. Leaving us with, I'm just going to do Linux. We're going to go say Linux. And I guess the question now comes, do I want a pre-made Linux distro? Um, the issue with those are it's very hard finding pre-made Linux distros these days that support 32-bit systems. Because 64-bit systems have come out, man, over 14 years ago, the Core 2 chips became common. And that's when 64-bit became something that was very common. So very few people are still running 32-bit systems at all. And they just kind of assume if you're running 32-bit, just spin the 50 bucks and get a better system at this point. So it's pretty much gone down to pick one of a few lighter weight distros. And I've used Debian before, and I'm probably going to go back to Debian as the base OS. The nice thing with Linux is, due to how it's designed, you can kind of run whatever software you want on even older systems, because they kind of just compile what you need. And I'm pretty comfortable with Debian. Um, CentOS stopped supporting 32-bit um, a little bit ago, because it's another OS that assumes by now you should be running 64-bit hardware. Um, you could always use stuff like Gen 2 or Arch and stuff, but I'm just kind of a Debian fan, so I'm probably going to stick with that. Now, the next question is, what hard drive should I go with? So, a few things I have is I have a pile of old hard drives that I'm going to probably use in this, and while they aren't the most reliable, they work. So, looking at these hard drive trays, I noticed they don't have slots for 2.5-inch drives, which is going to make it annoying. So, I can't easily put well, some of my old laptop drives. Because I have a pile of 500 gig laptop drives, because no one seems to want 500 gigabyte laptop hard drives now. Time to pay, play Let's Pick a Hard Drive. So, I have these boxes of hard drives that I have accumulated from different places, and I'm going to be picking one. So, looking in this big box I have here, I have a lot of 3 tears, I have a lot of 2s, um, a lot of these 2 tears are these Seagate video drives I have here. Which are fine, the problem with those are they don't work in most NASes that I have. Just because um, somehow I think they require a SATA signal from the system to start up. That's something I wanted for like these little like video DVR boxes. And they work in almost all desktops, they just don't work in server NAS boxes. So we're going to start taking some. Um, I think these one WDs have the same thing, they're like WD green drives for like video use, which is a weird use. Um, I've just seemed to accumulate them all very cheaply. I don't know. Um, we're gonna start pulling out some drives. So I pulled out a 500 gig Seagate. Uh, this is another green power drive. Here is a 500 gig WD. I have no idea where this guy's from, but we'll pull him in. Um, yeah, it looks like it. I, I think the two toes will work. I can't use the three toes in there because there's a two tibby byte limit in the system. So those won't just work, even if I wanted them to. I have a second box here. We have some more, so similar of those. Actually, this is a different, this is a bad drive, I think. Um, here's a 300 giga we're going to put in here. Uh, actually, a 320. These are both IDEs. Um, here's a 200 max, though. I might as well throw that guy in. And then we have to get one more, one more. What do we got? 200 gig C8? Sure. Let's throw this guy in now. Now for the boot drive. Um, I could use a big one of these big guys, but since I'm using USB power, it's a lot easier to just use a 2.5 inch drive. Let's talk about OS drive. So I've selected all my data drives already. So for OS drive, I was going to run just this. It's a 8 gigabyte SSD. Not super fast. Really cheap. Have them laying around and nothing else I can use them for. So I'm going to just be putting this in a USB to SATA adapter, which I have laying around. And I'm going to just plug this guy into a USB port. It is a USB 3 one, but eh, it'll be limited by USB 2 speeds and just be slow. Then again, Linux in a command line, Debian in a command line without much running doesn't really take that much. Um, next thing I'm going to do, um, this is a USB virtual CD-ROM drive. I'm going to be using that as the boot media. And then I'll get the OS installed and I'll show you how its menu and everything works in the BIOS. It's kind of weird as a NAS to have a full working BIOS, but it does. All right. Here we are in the BIOS of the system. Looks like any other BIOS. So you can see standard CMOS features. I need to set the date. Um, advanced CMOS features. It's a pretty much normal BIOS. You get a ton of options. Um, advanced, like how much do you want to? How many megabytes do you want to give the onboard VGA? Which 
You don't need much. I'm not running gooey on those 8 megs. <laughs> They're not going to hurt me when you only have half a gig. Um, so the next big thing now is just getting an OS on it. So we're going to just save and exit setup. Save and exit. And then what should boot into my Debian installer. So I have a Debian network installer for 32-bit, um, which should work fine. Which, um, realistically, Linux is kind of the only OS that works okay um, on these systems. Uh, Windows, you just, I don't think you can run anything past 7 and you have to deal with that. It doesn't seem to want to boot from the internal drives at all. Here's the Debian installer. I expect it to be a little bit slow on it. I think it's technically a Celeron M system. Yeah, it's loading now. It normally doesn't take this long. So it's now fully set up and I booted into a command prompt in Debian. So it's ready to be logged in and used. So I'll do that. Also, SSH works, so that's probably where I'm going to be most of the time. The other thing I have here is I've gotten all my drives mounted in the little trays and I'm ready to start slotting these guys in now and all the storage. Um, looking software wise my plan is to probably put standard media sharing so I'm probably gonna put standby on it in case I want to use that. I'll put um, NFS servers in case I want to mount with that and then um, I'll probably use it as a Borg target, target for backing up other systems and then I was going to have it use rsync to copy it from there. And to manage the storage, I was probably going to use SnapRaid and MergerFS. I haven't really played with that before, and I kind of want to see how it goes. Here I am logged into the system. I can go like uname dash a to show what it is. So it's Linux 4.19. Because it's a net install, it's already fully up to date. So I don't have to worry about updating it at all. Um, it's missing some software that I like to have, so I could sudo apt install, like, I like tmux, I'm gonna put htop on it, inload, sysstat, vim's always nice to have, and that is my general list of kind of software I put on every system just for monitoring. Now, the one thing I'm gonna notice is this is gonna take quite a while to install, uh, because it's just booting from a very slow drive, which we can take a better look at once we get these programs installed that can show us disk utilization. So now that it's done, I can open up Tmux and I look at HTOP, I could see my single core chugging along, my 430 megs of RAM, and my half a gig of swap. I like to run iostat-xm1, and that'll show you all the disks in your system. So if we run lsbok on the next screen, we can see that SDA is a boot drive, 7.5 gig SSD. FD Zero, I think, is the floppy drive on the system. It's just kind of the, he said you had a 1.44 meg drive. You probably don't. Um, and then I could see B, C, D, F, and G. So those are all my five drives I put in, which is good. It sees them all. Um, we're going to check one more random thing. We're going to check the date. Yep, that looks right. So that's good. Um, and then we're going to set up MergerFS and SnapRate. So a few things to do that. First of all is finding out how you want to set it up. So with MergerFS and SnapRate, first you have to have it so that your biggest drive is your parity drive. So that will, it, it's basically a non-distributed parity um, system. So one drive stores it all, and that's going to be your biggest one. So it looks like SDB is a um, 500 giger, and SDD in this case is both a 500 giger. They also seem to be basically the same size, so we're going to just use B here. Some of these have partitions, so we're going to wipe them all though. Just to make life easy, we're going to do wipe fs dash a slash dash slash sdb running wipefs while technically not needed it just makes everything nicer because now all my partitions are gone and i can start fresh and every once in a while you get a problem of hey someone's using your partition so now to going and setting up mounts so the first thing you have to do with um snap rate and mojo fs is because both of those utilities are file based not block based something else has to manage all the blocks so we're going to just partition these and then um throw ext4 and all of them and then set them to auto mount so we're going to sudo make um, mk de, uh, slash mt slash disk1, and we're going to just do this through 5. You can call it whatever you want, but they're just nice ones. And then we're going to do sudo um, g disk slash dash slash sdb. Uh, I don't have g disk right now? I guess I could use fdisk. Uh, it's just that's basically gpt versus um, um, mbi. It realistically won't matter here because I can't even put a big enough drive here. Uh, yes, we'll move the signature and we're going to write it. So now I've written one partition and I'm going to do that for the rest of the sys drives. Just have a single big partition. A lot of file systems like, um, like ext4 like to have a single partition and don't really want to run on the bare drive itself. 
So now that everything's been there, we can see that we've made a full size pipe tester. Just check everything's the full size, and it looks like there is. And then you're going to sudo fpass.ext4 slash dev stress sdb1. And it's going to take a second or two and set up a ext4 file system on all this on that drive. Next thing we're going to do is mount all the drives. So actually, we're going to make a um, directory slash imagery slash parity. This is going to store the parity files. It's going to be the largest disk. And then we're going to use fstab to mount it all. Um, so we use the UUIDs because that um, has the least chance of having issues we're using BOKID, which is being very slow on here. But I don't know why. Um, the other, we're going to make that mount directly for slash mt slash parity. And then here we have all of the devices. So you want to use UUIDs for mounting. Just get yeah, basically always do. And then we want to look at it and we want to see which drive on is a parity. So that's SDB. And we're going to see SDB here. So that's the UUID equals that. Copy and paste is your friend. And you're going to do slash mt slash parity. Uh, ext4 is the partition table. Um, I like to put no fail in, and there's some more options, but defaults, other than that, defaults are fine. No fail basically just says if it can't mount it, it'll continue booting, like nothing happened. Um, whereas you can tell it often it will fail, and that will make it um, so that your system won't mount, which is fun for NAS where it's connected via the network and it just hangs during boot up. So I like to set all of those. All these drives in the mount options so we could test that sudo mount a and that will attempt to mount everything by default according to fstep and we run it and we see we have all these drives here and now it's time to set up mojofs and snapper so those are both paired um, file based stuff so we have everything set up with files that we want so let's get those guys installed first thing is mojofs um you can get these on their github but if they're available in the repos you might as well do it and it keeps it updated so it looks like debian has mojofs by default also install fuse which means it's fire running a file system as a user operating instead of the system level and it takes a sec to upgrade that so looking at the snapraid website we see a tarball for the software we could see a few binaries for windows and then we can see um they say they have a ubuntu launchpad package but i poked around in that it's kind of a pain some stuff's not really set up right there so we're just gonna use this so we're gonna right click the tarball we're gonna say copy link address uh, copy link location, switch back over to the command line, and then we can just do wget paste it. It'll take a second to download, and then we can do tar xs snap raid, and then we see the snap raid, and we could tell looking at this that it's probably a binary. So we're gonna do um, dot slash configure, configure. Um, and this would say, well, we don't have a compiler, so we're going to do sudo apt install gcc. And this is the fun and exciting process of trying to compile programs. One other package we'll need is make, so we're going to just install make. And it will take a second or two to go fetch that from the repos and add it. Looks like it's actually pretty quick compared to gcc, though. And then we can just do make, which does the actual compiling of the program. Which may take a while because this is a very slow system. We can see we're maxing out the CPU on here. And about a minute later, it's ready. So we can do make install and it's going to complain. Because you have to run it as sudo. And sudo will let you just run snapraid. And that looks good. Snapraid's installed. So, now, here we go. We can go df-h here and look at that. And we're going to go sudo vim slash etc slash fstab now. And now we're going to add the merge fs options. And what MojoFS will do is we're going to take all those disks that we have, those disks 1, 2, 3, and 4, and have it make it one big drive. So we're going to call it um, slash mnt slash, going to make it directly sudo amount, the slash mnt slash merge, or just call it that. Doesn't matter. So now under getting MojoFS set up, you can mount this just normally in the command line, or you can use fstab. And the advantage of using fstab is it does it automatically at boot. So we're going to do slash disk star, and that would just mean if it has slash disk slash whatever it'll mount, we're going to mount it at slash mnt slash merger. We're going to have the file system type of fuse slash merger fs. And then we can get to the options in merger fs. And there's a reasonable amount of options depending on what you want to do when it comes to mounting it. 
So a few options you're gonna want is you're gonna want allow underscore other. This basically lets anyone who's not the person who mounted it, because it is fused, so it's running as a user space to use it. Um, use ino is another recommended option. It causes it to use that instead of libfuse. It's just recommended for managing that. And then we're gonna put in zero space zero. And what this will do is it'll mount all the drives under slash mount slash disk, mount them as slash merger, and it'll just merge it into one virtual file system. So you can do this sudo mount dash a now. Now if we run df dash h, we can see slash mt slash merger, which has a little over a terabyte available. So if we see slash mt slash merger, we can do something like, uh, we're gonna just say touch test, uh, do a sudo, we'll talk more about permissions in a little bit. Um, and then we can run like tree app install tree. And then if we do cd slash um, mnt, and then we run tree, we can notice that So now let's take a look at how MergeFS works. Because it's a file level on merging, it's pretty dumb, realistically, which is nice here. So if I ls here, if I do touch um, bucket, we're just going to make an empty file called bucket, and run sudo tree on all these files, we can see it just put anything on merger onto disk 2. And there's some options of depending on which disk you want, but we're just going to let them put. And it looks like it's just putting it on the disk with the most space. So that looks fine. The nice thing is I can rip out disk two and copy all my files that I just put on there. And, and I don't need to have anything. Whereas with LVM or RAID or something, I'd have to go on that system and make sure I can get all the drives at the block level. So even if all this drives, so it's kind of like Unraid, but it is a bit different. So now let's talk about parity. So parity is now managed by snap rate. So we could see snap rate here. So now I'm gonna configure the snap rate content file. So this just tells it where snap rate should expect its files. So we're going to make it in slash etc slash snapraid.conf. We're going to tell it which our parity file is, because parity is just one big file. Content just tells it how it's laid out and set up. You need it up on a couple of drives. I'm going to put on all of them for good measure. I'm going to call them something a little bit different, just so MojoFS doesn't do anything weird. Might not have to. I'm going to tell it which drives are the data drives. And then we're going to close it. And then we'll do uh, sudo snap raid and status. Yeah, and it's gonna think about it, and it's gonna say, yeah, there's nothing over on it, because it's empty. And this is gonna run the first initial sync, and then we can run status, and it will tell us that we've used a tiny bit of space. If we go to cd slash mt slash merger, we could see the snapwrite.content files, you don't touch those. And then you can do that. You can also add some directories, which might have been smarter to do, so that it has like a data directory so you don't see the content files, but nah, we don't need to. Um, you can also run a scrub that will go and test it all for um, data to make sure that uh, all the files are there. So now that this is set up, so let's go set up some file sharing so we can dump some files on this. So we're gonna go sudo apt install Samba. Samba is your nice little friendly Windows file sharing. So this sets up standard Windows file shares that Windows systems and most other OSs can easily access. So now that Samba is installed, we're gonna do a really simple Samba setup. So we're gonna do sudo vim slash etc slash smb e slash, uh, it's actually samba slash smb dot conf. This is your big config file. You don't want really to touch any of this. Uh, we're just going to call it um, merger. And we're going to call path equals slash mnt slash merger. Um, and then actually we're going to make it slash files. We're going to do that. Um, that comment equals merger fs files. Um, we could do, we could set other ones, but that should be done fine by the default and it'll follow the partition. So we're going to do sudo mpg slash mp slash mojofs slash files. This is just going to hide the um, hidden stuff under it with like the snap raid content files. So yeah, I don't see those and you don't accidentally delete them or mess with them from the file show. 
And then we could do sudo op system control restart samba. One thing I noticed that I set incorrectly was I set my password so that um, one thing I had to do is enable the writable option in the Samba. But now it's copying and fortunately you can't see it, but it is going at a pleasant uh, 15 megs a second. So definitely not the fastest, but not that bad either. Now let's take a look at utilization monitoring and see what we can see. So we see SMBD foreground, no process group, is using quite a bit, that's SMB, MojoFS is using a reasonable amount, SMBD, so that's kind of it. Disk utilization looks pretty low, SBD is the drive it seems to want to copy onto now, and it's not sitting too high in the utilization. So it's definitely an older system that can't do too much, but 20 megs a second is fine for backups that you're running in pretty much a write once, read, write a few times and read rarely unless something bad happens. So the initial snap rate sync finished, and as we can see here, here's the output. So it says what the wait time's been on, and it's basically been waiting to compute the parity. It wasn't the fastest, I think it completed in roughly four hours, which, eh, not great, not terrible. And you can run scrubs now and look at the data, and the answer is yeah, it works pretty well for this type of workload. And while this NAS is far from a great NAS, it works actually reasonably well for my uses here. And I hope this helps setting up a little kind of backup NAS. My plan with this guy for the new future is to just kind of leave him off in a back room and sync him every couple of months with any updated files. And just see how it goes. I might do an update if it keeps working or has weird issues or something like that. But for now, it should just be a silent, just hold files quietly if something bad happens to the main array. So the initial snap rate sync finished. And as we can see here, here's the output. So it says what the wait time's been on and it's basically been waiting to compute the parity. It wasn't the fastest, I think it completed in roughly four hours, which, eh, not great, not terrible. And you can run scrubs now and look at the data, and the answer is yeah, it works pretty well for this type of workload. And while this NAS is far from a great NAS, it works actually reasonably well for my uses here. And I hope this helps setting up a little kind of backup NAS. My plan with this guy for the new future is to just kind of leave him off in a back room and sync him every couple of months with any updated files and just see how it goes. I might do an update if it keeps working or has weird issues or something like that, but for now, it should just be a silent, just hold files quietly if something bad happens to the main array.